So good morning, everybody. I will continue on the chapter about age and sex composition. But before I say that, um, because classes were canceled last Thursday because of the winter storm, we're going to have two quizzes today that we will open on Canvas right after the, the end of this class. And then on Thursday, we are going to have our first exam, okay? And that information is available and updated in the syllabus. So if you just um, go and check the syllabus in the course website, so quizzes four and five will be available today. And actually just giving a tip here, both of them, the content is gonna be about age and sex composition. So there is a chance that, I think it's the low chance, but the same questions you might, you could receive on, on quizzes four and five. There are a lot of questions about the age and sex composition in the question bank, but there is a chance that could come out as the same questions. And in whatever topic we finish today, if we reach to word population, a change over time, but I, I don't think we're gonna be able to finish chapter 10 and go through all chapter 12 today. So in whatever topic we finish the class today, that's gonna be uh, the final material that will be covered on exam one on Thursday, starting from chapter one until whatever we cover today by the end of the class. And just remember that for the exam, it's gonna be the same style of questions as quizzes. And um, try to study using textbook, reading the lectures that are available in the course website, reading your notes that you have been taking throughout the semester in these first weeks. Also studying group, because right? so that's something that I have been always telling people. And, um, so yeah, so pretty much reading the course material, textbook, slides, and your notes and studying groups. That's what I think people have been doing uh, the best in the exams. And of course, attending the lectures in person or watching them online. On exam days, we do not have in-person classes. So this coming Thursday, there is no in-person classes. You can come to the classroom here if you want and take the exam here in your computer if you think this is a quiet room, but you can take it anywhere. The only thing that I suggest is that you take in a place that's quiet and you are concentrated on it. And if you have just one uh, screen on your computer, just have the slides open, just have the textbook on your side, your notes on your side, on your computer screen as well. So you can, look at them throughout the, the first exam. But also be concerned about the time. There is a time limit to answer the 40 multiple choice questions. And that's one hour and 15 minutes after you start the exam. But the exam will be available on Canvas on Thursday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Once you start it, you have one hour and 15 minutes to finish it, okay? Any questions you might have, issues with on online connections, just let me know in the day of the exam. But usually people have been not having issues even when the internet crashes. People are able to reopen and the time starts from where it closed. And because uh, you're gonna have to be online for a long period of time, I suggest you being connected to the Texas A&M wireless connection. That's a better connection than staying at home. And technically you can come to the classroom here physically and take the exam here using the internet connection if you don't wanna to go to somewhere else in campus like in the library, okay? Any questions? All good. So I will continue on the lecture about um, age and sex composition. We talked about age dependency ratios in the last, uh, at the end of the last class. And now I'm gonna talk about some more technical um, issues that demographers face when they're analyzing 
information about age of population. Whenever we collect information about age, how old people are, we either ask them how many years they have, how many completed years they, uh, they have or how old they are in years, or we can also ask them their birth date. But when we ask individuals how old they are in years, they are in some cases in some countries or populations that we might experience some issues with the data that people report to demographers or just to the person being uh, the interviewer. And demographers usually use data for every single age in order to analyze the quality of the data related to the age of the population. So when we analyze, I have been showing you here, fertility rates, mortality rates, migration rates. Whenever do those rates, we usually group them in at least five year age groups, right? From zero to four, five to nine, and so on. But technically before we do that, and if we know that in a specific population, people don't report their ages correctly, it's good to analyze the information, but in that case, for every single year of age. And this issue of age heaping happens if a population uh, reports with a higher chance certain ages in, instead of others. So it's really common in some populations for people to report their ages, running it up to the zero, or five digit or rounded it down as well. So instead of someone saying that's 44 years old, the person says that's 45 years old. Or instead of saying that uh, they are 31 years old, they say that they are 30 years old, right? So when we have this preference for digits, we might have issues of uh, the quality of information about age. And age heaping tends to be more pronounced among populations or population subgroups with lower levels of education. There's an empir empirical finding, usually people with lower levels of education, they tend to report, the chances of reporting their ages in an incorrect manner is higher, right? But even this uh, reporting of ages in an incorrect way could be also related to cultural reasons. And here in the textbook, the author mentions, for example, that the, the number 13 is usually avoided in the US because it's considered unlucky. Even in the US and some Western countries, sometimes like uh, buildings don't have uh, a floor designated at thir as 13. The number of four, for example, in Korea and China, because it has the same word character as death, it's also avoided by people from those countries, right? So it can be related to people not knowing exactly their age. It could be related to lower levels of education, but it could also be related to cultural reasons. So what demographers came up with is a technique to try to estimate if the information about age has good or low quality. And this Whipple's method pretty much measures the preference for the terminal digits of zero and five. And usually this method is implemented for people, between, people reporting being between 23 and 62 years of age. So basically in the numerator, we put people that reported, we count how many people reported being 25 years old, how many people reported being 30 years old, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, and 60. We just count the people who reported being at these ages, 25, 30, 35, and so on. And in the denominator, we put everybody, everybody, between the ages of 23 and 62. Everybody who reported being between the ages of 23 and 62. 
And then just multiply by five and by 100 as constants. So they, they just help us analyzing this, uh, this, in, this, this index. So technically, this equation, this Whipple method, could have the values of 0, 100, and 500. Zero would be the minimum, right? When nobody reported being 25 years old, 30 years old, uh, 35, 45, and so on. Nobody reported their ages ending with the digits zero and five. If nobody reported being on these ages that end with zero or five, the numerator equals zero. Zero divided by any number, zero. Multiply by any number, zero. So that's where we get the zero from. And let's say that there is no preference for zero or five. People are randomly distributed across all these individual ages, all these single ages from 23 to 62. So the same number of people are observed uh, for 23 years of age, 24, 25, and so on until 62. And remember, in the numerator, we are just putting the people every five years, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and so on. And here we have for every single age. So pretty much if people are distributed randomly across all these groups, if we divide this numerator by the denominator, we're going to have one-fifth, right? So we have... Uh, one person the numerator for every five people in the denominator because they're randomly distributed across these ages. Here we have all single ages. Here we have every five ages. One fifth multiplied by five, it's one multiplied by 100, 100. So 100 when there is no preference for zero and five. And let's say that everybody in a population reported their ages ending with digits zero or five. So if everybody in the population has their ages being reported that's ending with zero or five, the numerator and the denominator will be at the same size, right? Because there'll be nobody here, 23, nobody here, 24, nobody here, 61, 62. And this number here is gonna be the same number in the denominator. Same number numerator in the denominator, one times five, five times 100, 500, right? So technically, the Whipple's method, this formula can have any number going from zero, result in a number going from zero to 500. But empirical data shows that that's not real cases of our population. So demographers came up with this scale. Whenever um, we get a ripple method, the result is less than 105, we say that the data collected about age is, really, is highly accurate. If the Whipple's method gives a result be, uh, between 105 and 109.9, the information about age is fairly accurate. 110 to 124, approximate, 125, 175. The information about age is rough. And if the result is above, is 175 or above, the information about age is very rough, okay? So let's see some examples of age distribution for single ages for a couple of countries. So here we have Republic of Korea. The year here is not important because we're just analyzing the quality of the data. What you see is that, so you have here the number of people, the population for each single age. And you do see variations over time, but you don't see any, you see variations across the ages, but you don't see any preference for a specific digits. 
And you have this last group here because here we are adding up everybody with at least 85 years of age. So that's not actually an issue of the reported ages. It's just how we graph them in this figure. And the Whipple method gives us the result of 100.1. Just going back to the scale, we have highly accurate data collected for Korea in 1995 for uh, age of their population. When we look in Pakistan, data from 1981, then we start to see some jumps from one single uh, year of age to the other. So for example, here, we see people reporting 20 years of age, really high, and then it drops, 25, really high, drops, 30, and then really high in 40, 45, 55, and so on. So you see this preference for ages ending in zero or five. The Ripple's method gives a result of 330, which shows that this information about age uh, collected in Pakistan for this specific year is very rough. Whenever, this is just a simple, just a simple histogram that you can have for your population by age. And then you, when you see data like that, it's a sign that you should not estimate any indicator for this population for single years of age. You should always group these ages, at least in five-year age groups. But then if you see really pronounced, even more preferences for only four digits and only four numbers uh, and in digit zero, you should also consider uh, creating, aggregating the age groups in every 10 years of age. So this is just a simple exercise that you can do just to see if the information about age is accurate that we are collecting from that population, right? And now going more into analyzing the sex structure of population. As I already mentioned to you here about the sex ratio, which is the most popular index for sex composition in demographic analysis. We pretty much divide the number of men by the number of women and multiply by 100 to get the information percentage terms. In general, national sex ratios, they tend to fall in between 95 and 102. So we should expect the national overall sex ratios, the overall number of men divided by the overall number of women multiplied by 100 to be something between 95 and 102. National sex ratios outside the range of 90 and 105 so if they are lower than 90 or higher than 105, this should be viewed as an, an extreme. Then you have to try to understand what's going on in that country that you have so many more men than women if the sex ratio is above 105, or so many more women than men if the sex ratio is below 90, okay? And we actually already did that in our first, when we discussed the first chapter, Introduction to Demography, I showed the same graph here. These are sex ratios from 1950 until 2015, as reported by the United Nations, more developed countries in green, the United States in blue, less developed regions in orange, and China in red. And then you see that more developed regions, overall sex ratio, they are below 100, so we have usually less men for, compared to women. That's a sign that although you might have more boys being born, women live longer. There is more gender equality in those countries. Women live longer. Women have higher life expectancy at birth than men. So across the years, we have more women than men in these populations. Hey. Okay. Cool. 
but we also see variations over time, right? In more developed regions, we see that this advantage in the overall numbers of women compared to men has been declining, or now you have numbers that are closer to 100. You start to have a little bit more men compared to women, but still less men overall compared to women, okay? And that might be the reason of improving mortality for men. So life expectancy at birth is still higher for women than men, but life expectancy of men has been increasing a little bit faster than the increases experienced by women. In less developed regions, the opposite, really high levels of sex ratios due to high preference for uh, boys. So in less developed regions, in China is a good example, we see uh, for cultural reasons, more preference for baby boys. And then when some women see that they are pregnant of daughters, they perform an abortion. But also in less developed regions, there is more gender inequality in their societies. So women have less resources since they are children and they are exposed to less opportunities to have higher education and have better jobs in the future. And that affects their mortality and their advantage in life expectancy is not so high as we would expect, right? So the overall number of men in those societies is higher than the number of women, even considering the population as a whole. Here is data for Korea only for one year, 1995. The horizontal axis here is not years, age group. And we see that for younger age groups from until around, uh, it's actually a lot here, 50 to 54, just by 50 to 54, the sex ratios, they start to decline below 100. So up to this actually older ages of 50 to 54, you have more men than women in Korea. So that's a sign that there is a much more preference for boys being born in these countries. And South Korea really has a good health system, good infrastructure, public infrastructure for the population. So the people who are born, they tend to live longer. There is a high life expectancy at birth for both men and women. So, but still because of cultural reasons, there is a preference for boys, they will keep surviving, although life expectancy for men is lower than for women. And, but because of this preference, you still have sex ratios above 100% up until older ages. And then only after that, because women live longer than men, sex ratio starts to decline at older ages. And they reach levels below 100, right? So in these cases here, you have more women than men. So really simple graphs about um, sex ratios over time in this graph and across age groups in this one, we can understand what's going on in those countries, right? In really basic uh, demographic terms here. Sex ratios by age group, the same exercise, but now for the United Arab Emirates. And you see that actually in the country, the sex ratio at birth doesn't seem to be so, um, so high. It's not so much higher than 105, right? This is not exactly the sex ratio at birth because sex ratio at birth is just for the people born in that specific year. So only people with zero years of age in this example. But you see that those children between zero and four, the sex ratio here is not so strong. But you see that actually the sex ratio starts to increase in older ages, in ages more related to ages in which people are in the labor market. So what might be going on here? This country is attracting 
workers to their industry, to their oil industry, and these workers tend to be men. So exactly in labor ages, you start to see an increase in the number of men in relation to the number of women in those countries. And as these people die or go back to their home countries after uh, retirement ages, the sex ratio starts to decline for in older age groups. And if you get this graph here by age, this is a graph that we are dividing for each one of these, these dots here. We are dividing the number of men by number of women. So instead of dividing, let's, let's show them side by side. And that's this age sex structure. We, in the previous graph, we just had this number here of men divided by number of women in each one of the age groups. And here, what the age sex structure shows us is pretty much the same thing. Higher number of men exactly in labor ages between 25 and 49, 54 years of age. And as these people get, they, they, they retire, they might go back to their home countries and the number of men in older ages decline or also because there is mortality as well, of course, not just because of immigration, but also because of mortality. But this case here is clear, the effect of immigration, right? You could have both immigration and mortality affecting the older age groups. Cool. Sex ratio at birth. So here, we focus on the number of boys divided by the number of girls that are born in a specific population, in a specific year. Most societies have sex ratios at birth of around 105. So that means that for every 105 boys being born in a specific population, in a specific year, we should expect around 100 girls being born. But some countries, as we mentioned before, such as China, Taiwan, South Korea, India, and several other Asian countries have been reporting really, really high sex ratios at birth since the 1980s. A main intervention is prenatal sex identification followed by gender-specific abortion, because in those countries there is a preference for boys, as I mentioned before. So what do you see? Uh, is that, for example, in China and Taiwan that have the Confucian patriarchal tradition where son preference is really strong, these previous birth planning policies that limited the number of children that families could have make an even stronger the preferences of family to have a boy, right? But also, because now there are some socioeconomic changes going on, industrial uh, transformations, people start to want to have fewer children. And as they have fewer children, they say, oh, among these few ones, I want to have, or let's say among the two that I will have, I want to have at least one boy. And that might affect the sex ratio at birth for these countries. So just looking at the data, that's exactly what we see. In the US, for example, the sex ratio at birth between 1980 and 2010 of around 105. So 105 boys for every 100 girls being born in those years in the US. And for China, really, really strong increases on sex ratio at birth, reaching around 120. So 120 boys being born for every 100 girls. And in Taiwan also higher than 105, but the maximum reaching around 110 boys for every 100 girls being born in those years in Taiwan, okay? Another uh, topic that we'll discuss throughout the the semester and is related to age and sex composition within this chapter 
is this process of a larger proportion of people in older ages. So there is this process of population aging going on across the world. So now we have large numbers of elderly persons and um, going on uh, increasing in the world because now we have declines in mortality. However, the large number of older people in the world per se is not a problem if these older people keep being engaged in the labor, in the labor market and producing goods, continue working in the labor market. However, as we saw for the age dependency ratio, it becomes a problem when the ratio of elderly people to producers becomes so high, generating um, socioeconomic problems. When you have countries in which older people, of course, for health reasons, and of course, because they want to enjoy those years of life, they are not engaged anymore in the labor market. They're not producing goods anymore. And they are pretty much consumers from those people in, the, in, in working ages. And then you create pressures in the society. Now you have proportionally fewer people work in the labor market than before. And just to give you big numbers about some projections of the older population, these numbers come from a table available in the textbook. By 2050, projections indicate that more than 2 billion people will be at least 60 years old in the world. And out of these 2 billion people, 22% will be located in China and 5% in the US. The same projections expect that by 2050, almost five, 450 million people will uh, be at least 80 years old. And out of those 450 million people, 25% will be in China and 7% will be in the US. So really, really big numbers of China uh, one out of four people with at least 80 years of age are expected to be in China by year 2050. And these numbers I just got from here. This is the population in the world, 2010 and projected to 2050, China, US, and here the projections for people with at least 60 years of age and 80 years of age. So pretty much what I just got here was these 460 million people here in China divided by these two billion. In the world, this 106 divided by this, same thing for these ones here in 450 million people with at least 80 years of age. So these numbers here come exactly from this table. Okay, but just to show how China has such a, big country in terms of population, it, and also improvements in mortality, people living longer will cause this really large concentration of people in older ages living in China. And that will put a lot of pressure in the economy of China if these older people are not engaged in labor activities, right? If they are retired and are not producing goods to, to the country. And this uh, figure here, Professor Jairo Nicolau here in the bottom of the slide, he's a professor in political science in Brazil. And I, I saw this graph on one of his tweets some years ago. I just thought it was interesting as an example why uh, age composition matters, right? Actually, this uh, figure was elaborated by him, but using data from The Economist. I just prefer his figure instead of the original one from The Economist because it's easier to, to see the country names here. So here in the horizontal axis, you have 
the, the percentage of the population with at least 65 years of age, right? So population age 65 years and over as a percentage of the total population. So the horizontal axis, for example, here is saying that Australia uh, data from 2017 had around 15% of the population with at least 65 years of age. That's what the horizontal axis is showing. The vertical axis is showing the government spending on pension benefits as a percentage of the gross domestic product. So out of all the goods produced in those countries in 2017, what the percentage out of that were used to pay pensions for older people, for retired people. So for example, in, let's get one that's easy to read here, let's say Canada, a little above 4% of all the goods produced in Canada back in 2017 were used to pay uh, pension benefits to the population. Pension benefits paid by the government, okay? Not private ones. So here we have a demographic variable being used in the horizontal axis, which would be our independent variable used in terms that we already discussed before. And government spending in the vertical axis being our dependent variable. And we see that as the percentage of people get older in those countries, there is, of course, a higher spending by the government on pension benefits. So there is a really increasing trend here, positive trend, a positive association between these two variables. And then you see some extremes, right? For example, Brazil, with around, let's say here, six, five, six percent of the population only with at least 65 years of age based on data for 2017. But already is spending, the government spending 12% of the GDP to pay pension benefits. And you have Mexico in the other way, around let's say 3% of the population with at least 65 years of age and really low government spending on public pensions, right? Japan, actually the highest percentage of the population with at least 65 years of age and 12% of spending, the same as Brazil. Brazil around 5% and Japan around uh, 27% of the population with at least 65 years of age. That shows that Brazil is gonna face a huge pressure on the government system to pay pensions because the population in Brazil is also getting older. Fertility is declining and people are living longer. So for the next decades, I showed you already age dependency ratios they will tend to increase after the 2030 exactly because of higher proportions of people with at least 65 years of age. So there is, or there are debates about reforms in pension system all over the world, all the time. In Brazil, there is also this debate because usually government employees in Brazil receive really, really high pension benefits when they retire. But then the discussion ended being usually right-wing politicians trying to cut pension benefits for a majority of the population that receive really, really low pension benefits. Why not tackle the issue of that small group of government employees with really high levels of pension benefits? Military, judges in Brazil, really, really high levels of uh, pension benefits. And because those groups have really strong lobby in the government, nothing get changes, or if it changes, it's not them who will be affected. 
So demographic changes bring economic challenges and by the end, politics gets in the way, right? So that's why it's complicated. That's why demography is part of a really complex world in which it's not just demography per se, but is affecting economic variables and how to solve that is being uh, tackled by political decisions, which usually do not take into account scientific analysis. It's more ideological than any uh, scientific analysis that sev several economists and demographers have been trying to understand as proper ways to reform pension benefits. Cool, but this is just an example to show how these simple age compositions, change of population over time, people getting older, higher proportion of people with at least 65 years of age, how that affects our daily lives, how this will affect us when we get older, how that is affecting already our relatives who are uh, re already retired or getting retired, right? Cool. So this is the end of this chapter about age and sex composition. The next one about uh, world population change over time. And, uh, and here I'm going to talk as discussed in the textbook, five contemporary aspects that are important to understand demographic changes in these last centuries and decades. And already talk a little bit about demographic transition. And understanding these changes in demographic indicators, declines in mortality, followed by declines in fertility. And we look history helps us understand our current societies and where our societies are going to in terms of demographic changes, demographic trends. So these first two topics here are from the textbook, are really based on the textbook, but of course you're gonna see that there are some figures that I take from other sources. And um, this other part here, global population trends extra, it's really kind of a, just a repetition to what I'm gonna talk in these first two parts but that's from another textbook. But this I will not go through in the, in the classroom. If you wanna read, you can read it, but that's extra material, right? That will not be covered in exams. But it's pretty much similar things that we are talking in the first two topics. So what are the five contemporary aspects that are important to demography? And the five aspects as listed in our textbook, the greatest demographic change in human history, a huge increase in population size, really high uh, gains in life expectancy, in other words, decline in mortality, fertility falling to really low levels in some countries reaching levels below 2.1 children per woman. So reaching levels below replacement. Fertility below the replacement level means that women on average are having less children that would replace themselves and their partners in future decades. So we usually expect that women on average should ha would have, not should have, would have uh, 2.1 children on average that would replace themselves and their partners in future decades. If that level of total fertility rates goes below 2.1, we say that those countries have fertility below replacement level. Why 2.1 and not 2? 0.1, exactly because we have seen that sex ratios at birth are usually above 100, so more boys are born than girls. So we have to produce a little more children to have a little bit more growth. And also because some of this, uh, some of this 
I missed the start here because of that sign. Some of these women who were born, some of these daughters who were born, they will not reach reproductive ages. So we have this extra 2.1 exactly for some of the daughters not reaching reproductive ages and they will not have children themselves. And see that I'm not being normative here. I'm just saying, look at empirical data and saying that in some countries we have fertility below the replacement level. And that 2.1, it's assessed as women replacing themselves and their partners. And the point one is the extra number of births that we, can, we need to have to, uh, to have uh, enough girls to replace their mothers and also enough girls to reach reproductive ages. So taking into account both high levels of sex ratio at birth and mortality. And related to just that, unbalanced sex ratio at birth, as we just discussed in, uh, in this previous chapter. Some countries, cultural reasons usually, have much higher uh, sex ratios at birth than expected. And population aging, just going a little bit further on this topic that we just finished from this previous chapter. So the human population has been increasing a lot in these last uh, thousand years. And we saw that uh, we reached 1 billion people just in the, around the year 1,800. We took like all oh, these millions of years, these thousands of years to reach 1 billion people, right? And then 130 years later, we added another 1 billion. Only 30 years later, another billion. Only 14 years later, another billion. And then start to increase a little slower, 13 years, 12 years, and then actually uh, 12 years again, and 13 years, right? So we expect that we will again take around 13 years to add, to add another 1 billion people in the world population. And that's a huge increase if we see all the history of humankind, of how slow we increase, and then exactly around industrial revolution, we start to be more efficient, in the way that we produce our goods. We start to understand science. We deal with public health. We deal with public infrastructure, water treatment, better conditions in birth, basic uh, hygiene procedures, washing hands before eating and so on. That makes population increase a lot in just much uh, less time than before. But for these last few decades, yeah, we still see an increase in the size of the population, right? In these last decades. But when you zoom into these last decades, going on here from 1950 to 2050, yeah, you see an overall increase in the population in the world but you see that the population in more developed countries has not been increasing as much anymore. The population in Africa is increasing more now. In China itself as well, in India, the same thing. And in order that less developed countries not taking into account Africa, China, and India also increasing over time in more recent decades. So what's going on now is that we still have an increase in the population in the world, maybe not as fast as we saw in the 70s in terms of population growth rate, but this population increase that we still have in the world is highly concentrated in less developed countries, right? And that's what 
this figure here is showing us. Again, these are UN uh, projections, projects from the United Nations up to the year 2050. And then the second topic, improvements in mortality. Over the past two centuries, especially since the end of World War II, the most important thing in human history has been the improvements in mortality that we experienced in these uh, last decades. Improvements in mortality make people, when we say improvement in mortality, of course, decline in mortality. Decline in mortality make us live longer. Life expectancy at birth increases. And this, all these changes that we have been experiencing in these last decades is a consequence and cause of a new way that we view the world. We now know that we can act better in terms of our health in order to live longer and with uh, fewer incidents of diseases when we get older. So we drink treated water. We, tend, we uh, try to at least live in areas that have a sewer system. We, have the, we are concerned with hygiene when we are eating. We, uh, as a society, we have births that much more uh, done in a more proper manner, more clean manner. We all take medicines when we get sick. We all get vaccines when they are available because we all believe in science, right? And also that affects not only ourselves, but the people around us. It's just knowledge of science becomes widespread in the society. We are in the university to learn science. We are all being scientists, social scientists, whatever major you are, right? And that change in our daily life affects how we are, the chances of us living longer, uh, living longer lives. And these transitions have been really transformative because people living longer, then you have population aging and uh, you start to experience other dynamics in families with fewer children as well, and more nuclear families instead of extended families and so on. And this is an example of how mortality declines make people live longer on average across the years. And this is data for Japan, dark and, and uh, light red the US in gray, and Denmark in yellow and orange. And for all cases, women living longer than men. So Danish women, Danish men, uh, American women, American men, Japanese women, Japanese men. And all improving life expectancy over time, data up to 2010. And as we know, uh, here, for this specific uh, example, we can see that in Japan, life expectancy at birth is the highest in the world. In this specific case, of course, we just compared to the US and Denmark, but levels of mortality are really low in Japan. And here you see Japanese women with the highest among women and Japanese men with the highest among men. And this, take into account this, one of these three countries, but as we already saw in previous tables as well, Japan having really high levels of life expectancy. Okay, so that's taken for granted, right? So life expectancy will increase. No, forever. This one here, I showed you that discussion about the projections um, that Elon Musk criticized the UN projections in previous class. And one of the tweets that comment on that was from Jonas uh, Schulley. He is a demographer in the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Studies in Rostock in Germany. And he posted a tweet, maybe just like a few days ago, 
talking exactly about this, how life expectancy actually decreased in several countries between 2019 and 2021. And these numbers here are in months, right? So Bulgaria between 2019 and 2021 experienced a decline of 42 months on the average of its population. Between 2019 and 20, a decline of 18. Between 20 and 21, a decline of 24. So between uh, 19 and 20 is this 18 here. So you see this 18 here is the same number. And another 24 and 24 added to 18, you have the 42. This 42 is this number here. Oh, no, but it might be something else, might not be related to the pandemic. But if we look at the average changes in life expectancy also measured in months between 2016 and 19, actually Bulgaria had an increase of 1.7 months in that period, right? And so just this read here carefully to understand the graph. Life expectancy changes since the start of the COVID pandemic. Estimates for 2021 are adjusted for the weeks with missing data. Not all countries have data for all the 52 weeks in the year. For those countries with data, not for the 52 weeks, this data is adjusted. This analysis here is adjusted for those missing data. The gray dots, these guys here, mark the average annual life expectancy change from 2016 to 2019. So this number here, plus 1.7, between 2016 and 2019, every year on average, Bulgaria increased their life expectancy by 1.7 months. This 1.7 is right here, the number. The 1.7 is also here in the horizontal scale. You see that this horizontal scale here is zero, negative, and positive. Let's get the US. The US between 2016 and 2019 was improving the life expectancy by around 1.1 months every year. Improving, not as much, because when you reach really high levels, of life expectancy is hard to improve, but it's still improving, 1.1 months per year. Pandemic started from 2019 to 20. We in the US lost around 24 months of life on average. 24, this number is exactly here. So just in one year from 2019 and 2020, Life expectancy at birth in the US declined by two years, 24 months. Oh, the problem, the problem is over. No, 2020 to 2021, another decline of additional 2.3 months, a total of 26 months in the US. Oh, 2.3 is nothing, it's controlled. No, but before, it was positive 1.1 months per year, and it's still negative 2.3 months per year. And aggregated, we have for two years a decline in life expectancy in the US of more than two years on average, right? And I'm, this data here is being estimated by Jonas Scholle and his colleagues and data estimated by the CDC here specifically for the US show the same trend. The CDC estimated that between 2019 and 20, life expectancy declined by around 1.5 years. He's estimating here two years. So anything between 1.5 and two years, right? And continue on the table, there are some countries that now in more recent in this last year from 2020 to 2021, actually started to see 
some improvements, right? And that's the case of France, Belgium, Sweden, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Slovenia. I just cited these ones here because they kind of like went back to the levels that they were before, almost reaching zero in this period, right? So this is just to show that yes, life expectancy has been increasing over the decades. We have been seeing talking about that since the beginning of the course, but that's not always true. And the pandemic is really causing really strong negative changes to life expectancy. In other words, mortality increases, life expectancy declines, okay? Cool. The third topic, below replacement fertility. The population growth rate, as I told you, has been declining in the more recent decades. It was like reached its highest level around the 70s. But it's still, the population growth rate is above zero. So it's still the population is increasing in size and more concentrated in less developed countries. But we have this tipping point here. The period of most rapid population growth is behind us. Since its peak, 1965, 1970, the growth rate has declined, falling roughly by half in 40 years as women have fewer children. So this decline here in population growth rate is related to the fact that now women are having fewer children. And uh, still people live longer, people continue to be here, but, and children are still being born, but not by the highest levels that we had in previous decades. So let's just see. Uh, trends of total fertility rate between 1950 and 2010. Dark red, less developed countries excluding China, because China has such a big population would bias these uh, estimations. The world average in orange and more developed countries in yellow. So the global fertility rate has dropped from around five to around 2.5 in roughly 50 years. And the average woman in developed country, developing countries outside of China, now they have around three children and they had on average six children back in the 1950s and dropping it to three children in more recent years. So fertility is declining in all these different countries. And as we talk, in more developed countries, you have fertility reaching levels below replacement. So fertility below 2.1. And of course, these trends, they vary by country, right? Some countries in Europe have even lower uh, total fertility rate. Some Asian countries, the same thing, Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan, low levels of fertility, and also uh, even some Latin American countries experiencing declines in fertility below the replacement level, such as Brazil, for example. But you see this overall trend of decline in fertility, which makes population uh, growth rate to decline as well. Unbalanced sex ratios at birth, this is just another example, similar to what we saw in, in the previous chapter. For India, and this is data from 1949 to around 2005, India, the sex ratio at birth, reaching levels be, uh, beyond above 105 boys per girls. And, and here, Although it's being mentioned sex ratio at birth, here we are measuring all children between zero and four years of age, divide this male children in this age group by female, multiply by 100. South Korea, it reached around 115 
by the mid 90s, but it has been declining over time. And then China and in Northwest India, you still have really high levels of sex ratio at birth. And the China trend is exactly similar to what we saw in previous graphs when we're comparing China, Taiwan, and the US. The sex ratio at birth in China, the biological normal, as I mentioned, it's around 105 boys being born for every 100 girls. But several societies have much higher sex ratios at birth. They have been experiencing rapid fertility uh, transition. And with that, those countries that have a really cultural preference for sons and they want to have fewer children, they usually use this new technology, ultrasound, and they perform an abortion in case that they will have daughters. Of course, not everybody, but that's a common practice in, in China. And we know that the one child policy in China happened between 1979 and 2013. And after that, the government relaxed the policy. Now, exactly, we saw that table before, right? One out of four people in the world by 2050 with at least 80 years of age will be living in China. Exactly because of this huge decline in total fertility rate, population is getting older in China and the population projection shows that for the next decades as well. But see that even with the one child policy, the name one child policy, the average number of children that women had throughout their reproductive uh, ages was around two children, right? So whenever we say about the one child policy, actually the total fertility rate was still reached around two children, below replacement level in more recent years, below 2.1 but around two. And one important debate that it has on this topic here is that this decline in fertility in China is not just related to the one child policy, but also because of economic development and uh, being more expensive for people to have children in more contemporary societies, urbanization. So all that make people once you have fewer children, because it's more expensive, because you want to have more resources to fewer children that you have. So this decline in fertility here in China, it's not only related to the one child policy, but also to socioeconomic changes. But in any case, when you have such a huge drop in fertility in China and in a country that culturally people have some preference, that will affect sex ratio at birth, right? Because of ultrasound and abortion. And there is an interesting discussion in the textbook that what this matters, this unbalanced, this highly unbalanced sex ratio at birth matters to the future of China. So first, why does China have high sex ratios at birth? Prenatal sex identification via sonar technology followed by female-specific abortion because people prefer boys. What would be the result of the high sex ratios at birth? Between 1983 and 2010, over 41 million extra boys were born than girls. 41 million, it's a larger number of bachelors in China than the total population in California, and in Texas, based on data in 2010. 41 million more boys being born in China between these years, and 41 million is not a small population. Population in California and in Texas, smaller than that, right? What might happen if boys don't marry? So there are some studies being done and exactly because of these studies and what this, the possible consequences of this really unbalanced sex ratios at birth in China might cause in social pressure, the government 
is taking this more into consideration. Most men unable to find sex partners will be poor, uneducated, unemployed, and migrate from rural to urban areas. First, when there is women can choose among a higher group of people who they will marry, they will marry the ones that are better educated. They will marry the ones that have better earnings. They have better jobs. That's a normal thing in life. And I, sh I told to you about this uh, marriage markets that people, marriage ads that people do in parks in China, kind of like point some signs and say why they are good people to marry. Oh, I have a car, I have a house. These are my earnings and so on. And for those that don't get married, they also will tend to move from rural to urban areas. In China, if you move from a rural area to an urban area without the permission of the federal government, you are not allowed to work in the formal economic sector. So you, you get jobs in the formal economic sector with lower earnings. You will not be able to access public education. So if you bring your children, they will not be able to access it. You will not be able to access uh, public hospitals, public health services. So these people will be even in worse situation. Some likely consequences that have been the topics of discussion among demographers and, and government policymakers that might increase crime, violence, prostitution, increase in uh, sexual transmitted disease, mainly among unmarried men, and an unprecedented spread on H of HIV. And specifically on HIV, in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2013, around 45 million, people, 45 million adults were infected with HIV. This was almost 71% of adult infections in the world. And specifically, so this is a stock, right? The overall number of people in 2013. Specifically in 2010, around 1.2 million people died from, H from AIDS and 1.9 people became infected with HIV in sub-Saharan African countries. China could equal or exceed these numbers now by 2020, 2030. So the country is beginning to take seriously the issue of HIV and AIDS and a possible epidemic. And we have been seeing that actually now they are really strict even in the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So they are taking these public health concerns seriously not just related to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also on these possible issues that they might face because of HIV AIDS. And remember, all because demography. Demography, sex ratio at birth, affecting public health, right? And the final topic, population aging, as we... Uh, also mentioned in the previous chapter, here in the horizontal axis of these age sex structures, we have the population in millions, not in percentage, just to exactly show how much larger are the population in developing countries compared to developed countries, right? And if we compare subgroups of this population, 43%, of the population below 15 years of age were um, living in sub-Saharan Africa, while only 16% of the population with less than 15 years of age were living in Europe, much younger population in sub-Saharan Africa. On the other hand, only 3% of the population with at least 65 years of age were living in sub-Saharan Africa by that time while 16% of the population with at least 65 years of age were in Europe. So Europe having a much older age structure and Sub-Saharan Africa having a much younger age structure. 
And we kind of see this for the big groups of developing and developed countries. In developing countries, much larger bars, wider bars for younger groups, while for developed countries, these bars are not so wide and you have more people in older ages proportionally, okay? So this is just a percentage of population age 60 or over that has been increased in the world. The first bars in more developed regions, the pink bars and less developed regions, the blue bars. So here I covered up to this topic of five contemporary aspects of importance in demography. So that's gonna be the last topic that we'll cover in the exam one on Thursday. This topic here about demographic transition will not enter in the exam. Thank you very much. Have a great exam on Thursday. And I see you guys again one week from now on Tuesday. Thank you. <laughs>